On a deserted footpath early in the morning of the 22nd of November 1983, a hospital worker witnessed a terrible sight. It would be the first case in the world where DNA evidence helped to find a killer. In a quiet village of about 6,000 people called Narborough in Leicestershire, violent crime is almost unheard of. It is something you expect to happen in a city, not in a small village community. 15-year-old Linda Mann was a typical teenager. Quiet but popular, she liked school and enjoyed being with friends. On a cold November evening, Linda left her home in Narborough to walk the mile or so to her friend's house. When Linda didn't return home by midnight, her worried parents called the police. Early the next morning, her half-naked body was discovered along a secluded footpath known locally as the Black Pad. Detective David Baker was called to the scene. Her clothing was in a state of disarray, her jeans removed. Uh, and her underclothes were strewn about. It was a cold night and she'd got a, a scarf around her neck and, and, and the scarf had been used uh, to strangle her. She was very brutally uh, attacked, sexually assaulted. Word of Linda's murder travelled quickly in the otherwise quiet village. The people were horrified, horrified. I'm very worried, particularly those with uh, young girls, young daughters. A search of the crime scene turned up little of substance. But the autopsy provided some important clues about Linda's last moments alive. The absence of injury to her private parts and also generally on her body, there was very little injury to her, would suggest that it was not a violent attack uh, and that she may have died very quickly. The conclusion was that um, she was strangled and then raped. A semen sample taken from Linda's body turned out to be an extremely important piece of evidence. It came from someone with type A blood and an enzyme profile which matched 10% of the adult male population in England. As Linda's body was found only a few hundred yards from a local psychiatric hospital, some speculated that the killer may have been a patient. Others weren't so sure. The thing that I was very anxious to establish was that it was unlikely to have been a psychiatric patient from the hospital. It was much more likely to be a man leading a normal life, perhaps with a, a family, uh, certainly one who had friends, relatives and contacts who thought of him as a normal individual. Police questioned thousands of people about Linda's whereabouts on the night she was killed. While detectives investigated every lead, fear held villagers hostage. I think young ladies should be very scared because we haven't found him so we don't really know what's happening at all. Yes, I've made an extra point of keeping my back door locked now whenever I'm in on my own. Well, any time really. Linda Mann was buried in a churchyard not far from where she was murdered. On the day of her funeral, police set up surveillance and videotaped the crowd for anything or anyone unusual. Often one finds that um, criminals will revisit the scene of the crime or some other uh, activity associated with the crime and it was just a precaution. Today police issued a new poster to try to jog people's memories. But it was of little help. The investigation dragged on for months, then a year. With no eyewitnesses, few strong leads and several false trails, the murder hunt hit a dead end. Time. Yes, please come forward. Whatever. All along, Linda's parents held out hope that their daughter's killer would be caught. The only thing that they could possibly get now was justice for their daughter, and that seemed to be going away from them. It's always frustrating when uh, you know you've not got an answer to a problem, and I mean you're forever looking over your shoulder, a to see what you've missed, and then trying to guess what might happen in the future. 
and the search for Linda Mann's killer continued for the next three years. Until the afternoon of the 31st of July, 1986. Another 15-year-old schoolgirl, Dawn Ashworth, was walking home from her part-time job at a newsagent. Instead of taking the main road, she took a shortcut down a thickly overgrown footpath called Ten Pound Lane. When Dawn didn't return home by 9.30 that night, her parents called the police. Another teenage girl was missing. Dawn Ashworth went missing last night. We've all hoped and prayed that this was not a repeat of the Linda Mann case, yes. Two days later, police discovered Dawn Ashworth's naked body less than a mile from where Linda Mann was murdered three years earlier. Like Linda, Dawn Ashworth had been strangled and sexually assaulted. Dawn had quite marked injuries to her genital area, which would indicate it was a very violent attack. Uh, and her injuries elsewhere in the body would also indicate that she had um, suffered violent injury, therefore she had been attacked violently, which would indicate that she had put up a fair struggle before she died. Semen samples taken during Dawn's autopsy revealed that the attacker had the same blood type as Linda Mann's murderer. There were other similarities as well. Both men were strangled. Both um, severely sexually assaulted. Both came from the same locality. They were both found in similar circumstances. And both girls attended the same school. Well, after the second murder, fear really took over. I mean, fear essentially grabbed them by the throat and squeezed the life out of them. Uh, two young girls had been killed. Families didn't know who was going to be next. All schoolgirls were advised to travel in groups and not to walk anywhere alone. Dawn's father had given his daughter the same advice. I warned her and warned her about the dangers of going down there on her own. We've got to find... the fiend, really, that did this to my daughter, to our daughter, and um, stop it from happening again. Police launched an extensive investigation into the murder of Dawn, and within a week, they got a breakthrough. Witnesses saw a young man near Ten Pounds Lane on the afternoon of Dawn's death. He was 17-year-old Richard Buckland, a kitchen worker in the psychiatric hospital, which was just a few hundred yards from where both Linda and Dawn had been murdered. Police brought him in for questioning, and he quickly became their prime suspect. For one thing, he knew details of the murder which weren't in the newspapers. In addition to that, when we'd questioned Mr Buckland, uh, he couldn't really account for his movements on uh, that particular afternoon. Finally, after 15 gruelling hours of interrogation, Richard Buckland confessed to the rape and murder of Dawn Ashworth. The police finally had their man. Given the similarities between the two murders, police were convinced that Richard Buckland also raped and murdered Linda Mann three years earlier. Richard Buckland denied it, but was he telling the truth? The answer lay just a few miles away, in a university laboratory. Richard Buckland had confessed to killing Dawn Ashworth but insisted he had nothing to do with the murder of Linda Mann three years earlier. Police were convinced he was lying and set out to find the truth here at the University of Leicester, ironically less than 10 miles away from where both teenagers were murdered. Dr. Alec Jeffries, a geneticist, had been researching hereditary diseases when he accidentally discovered an amazing technique called DNA or genetic profiling. There was a case of Eureka. You could see individual identification. You could see parentage analysis, paternity disputes, sorting out immigration cases. Former policeman turned author Joseph Womba wrote a best-selling book, The Blooding. It chronicles the events surrounding the murder of Linda Mann and the historic investigation which followed. David Baker said, well, look, let's cement the case against this young man. 
let's go to this geneticist at Leicester University, this Dr. Alec Jeffries, and take the semen samples from both murders and cement our case with this new thing called genetic fingerprinting, whatever it is, and let's just prove that he did both of them because we know he must have done both of them. Dr. Jeffries wasn't sure that he could do what David Baker wanted because this sort of analysis had never been done before. Dr. Jeffries' breakthrough technique for analyzing DNA is called restriction fragment length polymorphism, or RFLP. It can identify a person based on just a small amount of their DNA, which can come from semen, blood, hair roots and other cells. DNA is a complex chemical which is present in all living cells. It's a bit like a computer program containing coded instructions on how to make a human being. No two individuals have the same DNA pattern, except identical twins. Dr. Jeffrey's task was to take the semen recovered from Linda and Dawn and compare it to the blood sample from Richard Buckland to see if it was a match. First, white blood cells from Richard Buckland's blood sample were treated with a special chemical solution that allows the DNA, a sticky white substance, to float free. Next, the DNA is cut into smaller pieces using special proteins called restriction enzymes, which act like chemical scissors. The DNA fragments must then be sorted out by a process called electrophoresis. The DNA is marked with a radioactive dye and placed in separate lanes on an electrophoretic gel. Then it's subjected to an electric field. Under ultraviolet light, you can see how the electric current draws the negatively charged fragments through the gel to the positive end of the tray. The separated fragments are then visualized on X-ray film called an autoradiogram, which resembles a barcode, showing a person's unique genetic makeup. Dr. Jeffries first used this technique to resolve an immigration case, and after that a paternity dispute. But this was the first time it was ever attempted in a criminal case to reveal the identity of a double murderer. Let's start with uh, Linda Mann. This is her DNA profile taken from her hair. Next track is a mixture of semen and vaginal fluid from that victim, showing her DNA profile as expected, plus a single man semen DNA profile. Next victim, Dawn Ashworth. This is her blood DNA profile, a band here, and another one off to the uh, left. Trace amounts of semen recovered from that victim both revealed two faint bands whose position on the autoradiograph is very similar to the semen profile seen from Linda Mann. So, first conclusion, both girls have been raped and therefore presumably murdered by the same man. What about the prime suspect, Richard Buckland? This is his blood DNA profile here and here, completely different from the semen profile. Conclusion, both girls have been raped and therefore presumably murdered by the same man, and that man was not the prime suspect, Richard Buckland. The result shocked the police. It was, it was a blow to us. They didn't, basically didn't believe a word that we were saying, and that was quite right healthy scepticism of, of an entirely new technology. And indeed, I didn't believe the results myself, so we did retesting. The testing was done, again, independently by Home Office forensic scientists, all pointing to the same conclusion, namely that Buckland was not the guilty party in this case. After four months in custody, Richard Buckland was released and became the first person in the world to be exonerated of murder through the use of DNA profiling. I have no doubt whatsoever that he would have been found guilty had it not been for DNA evidence, he would have been jailed for life. I mean, that was, that was a remarkable occurrence. But why did Richard Buckland confess to a crime he didn't commit? Then the pressure started getting really hard. He just didn't have a chance. He had to have discovered the body himself, because in the terms of his confession, he was able to give a very detailed description of her clothing, where the body was, in what position it lay, the ligature and so on, details that nobody could possibly know unless they'd actually seen the body. With Richard Buckland now out of the picture, a double murderer was still loose. And of course the next stage was for David Baker then to make what I think was an incredibly courageous decision. 
he began a DNA manhunt. Police sent letters to all men aged between 13 and 33 living in the villages of Narborough and Enderby. The letter asked each man to volunteer for a blood and saliva test. Some have called it a genetic dragnet. It is voluntary and, and we are, you know, appealing to the people to come forward. I'm sure they expected uh, that the real killer, if he was indeed a resident of the villages, would probably try to uh, escape responsibility of giving a blood sample. DNA testing would only be performed on those who had the same blood type as the killer, about 10%. And it was really a, an attempt to try and flush out uh, the guilty party. Which is what it did. But not the way the police had hoped. It was a bold plan. More than 5,000 men voluntarily gave blood and saliva samples. But one worker at this local bakery didn't. His name was Colin Pitchfork and he was already known to police for earlier convictions of indecent exposure. He didn't want any further involvement with the police, so he persuaded a colleague, Ian Kelly, to take the blood test for him. Ian Kelly lived outside the area and wasn't asked to take the test himself. He was the perfect foil. Pitchfork spun him a yarn that um, he'd already given blood on behalf of somebody else who uh, couldn't go because he was wanted by the police, etc., etc. And uh, Kelly ostensibly swallowed that hook, line and sinker. Uh, Since police required identification before taking a blood sample, Ian Kelly needed some photographic proof that he was Colin Pitchfork. They both went to a photo booth and took a passport-sized picture of Ian. Colin took his own passport, slit the plastic casing with a razor blade and neatly inserted Ian's photo in its place. The police failed to observe that a, a photograph had been substituted for the original one and therefore they believed that this was Colin Pitchfork and there was his picture to prove it. Perfect. Ian Kelly then took the blood test for Colin Pitchfork. Of more than 5,000 men who voluntarily gave blood and saliva samples, none matched the profile of the murderer. But no one could anticipate what happened next. One summer's evening, a year after Dawn Ashworth was found brutally raped and murdered, Ian Kelly joined fellow bakery workers at this local pub. And the conversation turned to the DNA manhunt. A young woman in the group overheard Ian Kelly bragging that he had taken the blood test for Colin Pitchfork. She sat there and listened to that and thought to herself, there's something not right about this. This isn't something that someone normally does, no matter how afraid he is of the police. And so she put in a call to the Leicestershire uh, murder inquiry team, and that's what made them focus on Colin Pitchfork. Police quickly contacted Colin Pitchfork to question him about the blood test and what he might know about the two murders. Soon he confessed to killing both Linda Mann and Dawn Ashworth. Pitchfork uh, believed in DNA fingerprinting right away. Not that he knew any more about it than the rest of the world, but he'd been following it in the newspapers, and he believed in it. And he knew that it was as good as an inked fingerprint, and he knew he was finished when they arrested him. So he confessed quite readily. Without this breakthrough, the chances are the police ne would have never caught Pitchfork. And I think it's fairly clear that had he not been caught, then he would have killed and killed and killed again. Colin Pitchfork was 27 years old and married with two children. His wife had no idea that she was married to a serial killer. I think he was able to deceive her perfectly well so that nobody in the whole world knew that he was the guilty person. It's the same story. Uh the wife, the brother, the mother, the friends of serial killers never suspect that they could be serial killers. Colin Pitchfork was the last man to take a blood test in the investigation of the Man Ashworth murders. The DNA typing showed, to no one's surprise, that he was a perfect match.
and then they took the pattern on film from Pitchfork, compared it with semen recovered from the victims, and showed that, the, that these complex patterns matched up. On the 22nd of January 1988, Colin Pitchfork became the first person ever to be convicted in a murder case solved by DNA profiling. He was sentenced to life in prison. For his part in the deception, Ian Kelly was convicted of conspiracy to pervert the course of justice and sentenced to an 18-month prison sentence, which was suspended. He served no time for his crime. I was wrong for doing what I did. I think we've learnt a lot from the deaths of both of these two girls. Certainly the scientific advances that um, have been made with um, DNA has uh, spread itself now throughout uh, the world. It was this case of all cases where, on which DNA really cut its teeth in the forensic sense. The door has been opened to a whole new aspect of uh, medical investigation. People will be talking about this case a hundred years from now, not because of my book, but because of Alec Jeffrey's discovery. Coming up on Murder Detectives, Postal Morton. When a series of parcel bombs go off killing two people, police struggle to find a motive, but a mysterious third explosion leads them to the killer. That's next Tuesday at the earlier time of 11.30.